Good morning and welcome to our service of worship. Those of you who are here in-house and those of you online, uh, normally we have some folks who join us right on time. It's, we do the service with us and over the course of the week, about 100 other people join us as well. So whenever you join us and whenever you decide to watch this service, we're glad that you're here. Let us have a time of prayer. Our Lord, our God, you are worthy of all our praise. You are the God who never fails to keep his promises. We thank you that in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see your love, justice, mercy, provision, and victory. You are the God who lifts up those who are weighed down. You are the God who provides for your children. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live. Inhabit our praise as we gather together today through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing Rescue the Perishing. and all the children of God, sometimes it's easy to change. Remember when, maybe you remember you were in school and you had to wear special clothes for school, but when you got home, you got to change clothes, get into play clothes. And some of us remember Sunday mornings, we had to get all dressed up, but as soon as church was over, we got to change clothes. It was great. I still do that, some of you. Yeah, me too. You ever been around some babies? They need to be changed. There's some significant change that needs to happen there. Wool. And over the years, styles change. 
I graduated from high school in 1976 when we wear, wore bell bottoms and butterfly bow ties and it was happening. And I am one of the folks who actually owned a leisure suit. I wouldn't be caught. Oh, look, we got many hands, many hands of going. Yes, I, many, many, many people wore leisure suits. Look it up online. It, it'll be fine. So. But it was, it was the style. It was. And, and so, but things changed. And not one of us who had a leisure suit back in the day still has one now. No. And we wouldn't wear it if we did. Because things changed. Technology changes. Doesn't it ever? We change our habits. We can change our actions. And to this day, we're going to be talking about change. The adults and I are going to be talking about change while you guys are down in sparks. But change is part of life. It happens all the time. And it's not something to be afraid of, but it's something that maybe things could get better because of it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our boys and girls. We thank you for our children. We thank you, God, that there is a place where the, for them to go down in sparks and to learn more things about you and your love. We pray that uh, all of us will be open to the changes that are needful and necessary in our lives. And this we ask now in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're going to ask them to stand up and we're going to ask the praise team to start coming down. And we're, everybody's walking at the same time. I'll, I'll keep talking and they'll keep walking and it'll be happening. All right, and uh, we're going to invite you uh, to stand in body or in spirit, and uh, we're going to sing some songs. I tell you, my leisure suit, I, hmm? I had dark green pants, but I also had two other pairs of pants that went with it. So I had a dog tooth pair of pants, green, <laughs> and then a pair of sort of creamy white ones, all that went with it. So my leisure suit had a jacket and three pairs of pants. I wore it all the time. It was so easy. I mean, you just threw it in the washing machine and it, it was done, you know? Can't do that these days. <laughs> who am I? Get the right, who am I? Sorry. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name?
you hear me when I'm calling, Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours. Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave toss in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord you catch me when I'm falling. You told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. I am yours. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so
ask you to take your hymn books, turn to page 38. I'm going to ask those people who are coming into the membership of the church to come now, bring a hymn book with you so that you're not lost in our liturgy. I ask them to come now. No, uh, let's just do this here. Okay. If you join me down here, that's fine. No problem. There's a hymn book there. Page 38. Okay. All right. This is always a big day in the life of any church when you have new people joining the church, making a commitment, saying, I want to belong here. Church membership is not a one-way ticket to heaven. Church membership is a list of names that says, while I am here, I am going to serve here. I'm going to work on my spiritual life here with these people in a community of folks so that we're not Lone Ranger Christians and trying to do this all by ourselves. I do not think you can be holy all by yourself. We need each other. And to be part of a community of faith is vitally important. We're on page 38, and would you be so kind to present them, please? This morning we have before us some friends um, that we've had for a while and some new friends. We have Biff and Mary Bergner, and we have Heather McQuarrie, and we have Larry and Linda Shepard, and we have Tony Metric. So if you have not met Larry and Linda, please do so. Okay. This is for... Uh, Biff and Mary and Heather. As members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministry? And if so, answer, I will. I will. Okay. Now, for all of you who are coming into the local congregation, as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And if so, answer, I will. I will. To the congregation. Members of the household of faith, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. And let us respond. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you into Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The grace, God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to start this way and work my way down. Well, thank you. Buddy. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here. Okay. And I've got a certificate for each of you. Okay. You can show them some love. Thank you. Certainly. Okay. Well, 
we, I've, I've got a great secretary who helps me with all of this stuff. There you go, Tony. And Linda and Mary. Thank you so much. Give them some love some more as you head back. Thank you. We will take a picture after the service. I'm going to take a special moment. This isn't in the bulletin, but I'm in charge. Um, this is a real special day for a lot of reasons. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but this is my 52nd Sunday with you. Today, I complete my first year with you. We, we, <laughs> we complete our first year of ministry together, really. And what a year it's been. Six people just joined the church on transfer. Six kids got confirmed. We've had five people get baptized. We had a wonderful vacation Bible school with 69 kids in it, 28 volunteers. We have had an opportunity within our church to clean and tidy in ways that we haven't done in a long time. And the basement is now, well, you can walk through it. And we partnered with another congregation in our town. It's been a wonderful year. We even did things like get the balloon off of the fan. <laughs> There's been a number of wonderful things. I have only done, since I've been here, one wedding. And I would only have done that wedding, the only reason I did that wedding is because a member of our congregation is a wedding coordinator, and she needed an old retired army chaplain to do the wedding. Had I not been an army chaplain, I wouldn't have done any weddings in this first year. And interestingly enough, in the middle of a pandemic, in the last 52 weeks, I have not done one funeral or graveside service. No one from the membership of this congregation has died in the last year. Now, that means I haven't done my first funeral in Hayworth yet. And we can extend that as long as y'all want to. That'd be fine. <laughs> I am so looking forward to next Sunday um, because it starts year two together with all of us doing the ministry, all of us working for the cause of Jesus Christ to make a difference not only in our own lives, in the lives of people around us, but in our community and in our world. I am proud and pleased to be appointed with you once again this year. So it's great to be here. It's great to be your pastor. And uh, we're going to continue with the service, but I just wanted to take a minute. Say thank you. Our first scripture reading today is from the prophet Ezekiel. He's one of the major prophets. He's a major prophet because it's a long book. Very good. Okay, I'm, you guys are learning. This is great. Ezekiel wrote, Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. And here ends the reading of our first lesson for this day. Please keep your seats as we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
Let us pray. Yes, Lord, we want to turn our eyes on you and we want to turn our attention on you this day because of all the things that you have done in our lives. Oh, Lord, you've worked with us in so many different ways as individuals and as a congregation. And we are grateful, God, for your direction and your encouragement along the ways because there are times when we can get discouraged. There are times when we can have those moments when we're just not sure about what to do next. But we want to turn our eyes on you, not till we look to ourselves for our own wisdom or to other people for what other people may be doing someplace else. But may we always have our focus on you. We remember, O oh Lord, the Apostle Peter, as he was sitting in the boat, was, saw you walking on the water and asked to come out and walk on the water with you. And he was able to as long as he kept his eyes directed on you. But when he turned and looked at all the storms and the thunder and the lightning and the flashing and realized what he was doing, he went under. We pray that as long as we keep our eyes on you, we will not go under. We will not go under spiritually. We will not go under in any way. Help us, O oh God, to keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ this day and, and for this life that you give us. This day, O oh God, we would confess to you that there are times we have got our eyes off of you. We've got our hearts off of you. We've got, well, we've been all focused on ourselves, quite honestly. And it never works out real well. So we ask for your forgiveness and ask that you'd help us to change. Lord, we also think of others who've sinned against us. And we pray that we would have your spirit in us. And in the ways that you would forgive us, we might forgive others. Lord, we thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for the gifts of this life. There are so many wonderful things going on around us. And even when things are difficult, when there's water in the basement, having a wet dry vac is a blessing. Even having a broom is a blessing. There are so many things that are so simple and so ordinary that we don't really think about a lot until we need them so desperately. Lord, we are thinking about our friends and our neighbors who are struggling with water in their basement and water in their fields. And yet we know, we hear the forecast of more rain that's coming. Lord, we would pray for your help and as we deal with all of these issues. God, we have heard this morning of a friend of ours whose father has passed. And so we pray for him and his family as they grieve the loss. We think of God of friends of ours who are recovering from surgery whether it be a surgery of an eye like our bishop or a knee or a hip, for all those who are recovering. We pray especially for those who are looking for work. We pray that they would find not just employment but satisfaction. Lord, we also come into this time of prayer with our own week's worth of experiences and life. Lord, hear the prayers of your people right now. Remind them how precious and important they are to you. Remind them how important and precious they are to me. May they know your love and your mercy and your grace. May they know the comfort that comes from your most Holy Spirit. Father, for these requests on our hearts and minds, and all the things that we've lifted to you, all this we present in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Reading now from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 3, uh, 7 through 14. John the Baptist said to the crowds coming to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, from these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, The man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. The tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they said, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. And then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And here ends the reading of the gospel for this day. Well, for the last month or so, we've been talking about mending a broken heart. How do you do that? Now, for those who are listening on Podbean, there is a slide here on the screen. It's a picture of a heart. And if you look at it close, there's a couple scars because scars are always evidence of where pain and where hurt has been, but it doesn't hurt anymore, but you have the reminder of that pain and that hurt the rest of your life. And there's some people who walk around with scarred hearts because they have been hurt. They've been lied to. They've been betrayed. They have had moments where their heart has been broken, and there are people around us sitting in the pew with us, in our homes, in your pulpit, who've had some scars on their hearts. They're still there. Doesn't hurt as bad as it used to, but I can still look at it and see. And so can you. And for some of you, you see on the picture, there's like an ace wrap kind of around one of the ventricles. It's not done really well. It sounds, looks like it's a hurried kind of job. Looks like maybe a, an attempt at a first aid class. And sometimes people have tried in your life and in mine. They've tried to to bring healing to your heart. They've tried to do things. And there's a Band-Aid on one part of it. And then there's a wad of gauze and two pieces of tape holding it on for dear life. And people who have had broken hearts, maybe you identify with that. And we have, for the last month, really talked about how do you heal a broken heart? We talked about first, I'm sorry, saying I'm sorry, a genuine expression of regret. And for some people, that's all the apology they need. That's all they need to heal their heart. They just need to hear somebody sincerely, clearly say to them, I'm sorry. And they're good. But other people, "Uh -uh. that is no apology. Don't even think that you're saying, I'm sorry, is going to be enough for me. You've got to say, I was wrong. And a couple weeks ago, I, I brought to your attention that King Nebuchadnezzar and Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, and the prodigal son, all had those moments in their lives where they said, I was wrong. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Last week, we talked about how do you make restitution? In a relationship, how do you make restitution? If there's something with a field or car damage or something like that, you can do it with money. But in a relationship with somebody else, how do you make it right? How do you make restitution? And we talked about words. We talked about things like saying, you are so important to me, and I am so sorry. And those words make the restitution. We also talked about some people need acts of service, actions. What can I do to make this up for you? I will 
gas up your car. I will detail your car. I'll polish your shoes. I will, do, I will, I will fold the socks. I will do whatever it takes to make it right for you. Some people need to have a gift. Bouquet of Roses does a lot of good things for a lot of people. Or, for guys, if it's a candy bar. We were talking earlier. I'm becoming quite fond of Kit Kats, the lemon-lime flavor, just to let you know. (laughs) Not that I need a Kit Kat lemon-lime flavor, but I like them. Some people need time. When I take time with you, that makes things right. And other people just need a touch. And some couples, it's some little pinky thing. They hold pinkies, and and somehow holding pinkies reminds them of an early time in their relationship, and it makes everything right. Or sometimes it's a a touch on the shoulder. Sometimes it's a a hug. And that's how you make restitution. But you see, we've, we've talked about all this before, and this is kind of a review And so we can say, I'm sorry, and we can say, I was wrong, and I can say, what can I do to make it up to you? But for some people, that is not nearly enough. What if they do it again? Again. Now, on this screen, you will see rolled towels. I counted them. I saw this great image. There are... 13 towels rolled up and stacked in that picture. It takes time to roll towels. It's boring to roll towels. Again and again and again. And sometimes people will say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, how can I make it up to you? But then they do the same thing again. Again, from the book, The Five Languages of Apology, a short paragraph. We have the same old arguments about the same old things, said a wife who'd been married nearly 30 years. I think that's true of most couples. What upsets me most is not the offending action, it's the repetition of the offending action. He apologizes. He promises not to do it again. Then he does it again. It being something as small as leaving on the bathroom light. Or as annoying as needless crabbiness. I do not want apologies. I want him not to do the thing that bothers me ever. The woman wants her husband to repent. That would make it right. That would make a good apology because if you never do it again. And sometimes when somebody does something to you again and again, you may say to yourself or you may say to other people, how could they do that to me? How could they hurt me like that? They know it bothers me. They know it hurts. Why do they do that to me? Newsflash, it's not about you. It's never been about you. Think of the last time you messed up. Think of the last time you said something that hurt somebody's feeling. Think of the last time you did something. It was never about the other person. It was always about you. Last time I messed up, I wasn't thinking about anybody else but me. It's my needs, my wants, my desires. I was trying to be the comedian. I was the one trying to be funny, trying to be wise and witty, bringing joy and laughter, and it came out as an insult. It came out hurtful. Instead of bringing laughter, it brought tears. Why? Because it was about me. Because I wanted to be the center of attention. I wanted to be noticed. I wanted, it was about me. Comedians and public speakers sometimes have that problem. 
But think about those other times in, in your life when you haven't been a comedian or a public speaker, when you've just been living life. It's never been about the other person. It's about you. Let's take a look at a couple of commandments just for illustration's sake. A person puts together a resume because they need a job. And they write on the resume, I graduated in the top half of my class. And then there's some checking in the resume and you find that this person didn't graduate in the top half of their class. They actually graduated dead last in their class. Why didn't they just say, I graduated from the school? Why did you lie to us as you made this application on your resume? Why? Because I wanted you to think more highly of me. But now that you lied, I don't think highly of you at all. It's about me. It's about me. You ever watch any mobster movies? The Godfather, those kind of things. So why in a mob movie do they order a hit on somebody? Why would, what was happening? Do you remember? It's like, I want his territory. He's being a pain. I want him out of my life. And so knock him off. But me, what I want. Or maybe a different example of that. A young person drives by and shoots somebody who's just standing on the sidewalk for no particular reason. Why did you do it? Because it was the initiation into the gang. And I don't belong to anything. And if I, even if I have to kill somebody to belong, then I'll do that. Do you hear the loneliness? Do you hear the disconnection? I will do whatever it takes to meet my needs. And if I have to kill somebody to prove that I'm worthy to be in this gang, then I'll do that. How desperate is that? And it's about me. So don't say, how could they do this to me? Because it's not about you. It's about them. And if we're honest with ourselves, we've been there. And sometimes we say things if you would be so kind, sir. The tongue has no bones, but it's strong enough to break a heart. Be careful with your words. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. What a lie. What a complete and total lie. So what do we really want? What did the wife want? She wanted repentance, please. Here's a definition. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of heart, that leads to a change in action. This change involves turning from sin and turning to God when we talk about the vertical relationship. I'm turning from sin and turning toward God, but what, how does it work in the horizontal? How does it work between people on your left and your right? How does it work with people in your family? How does it work with your neighbors? Ah, there's the thing. It's a time to say, I'm going to do things different. Leads to a change in actions. And that's what people really need to see, a change in action. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Listen, look at this quote by uh, Charles Spurgeon. I like it. Surely no rebel can expect the king to pardon his treason while he remains in open revolt. Now, Charles Spurgeon was a, a Brit from about a century or so ago. And, and so he is talking about royalty. But how can we be in open rebellion and expect any pardon? How can you expect me to accept your apology when you're continuing to do the same stuff over and over again? And you know it hurts me. You know it bugs me. You self sin Don't go there, Carl. Don't go there. You 
It was interesting. On Friday night, I was on YouTube, and I was looking at this one particular YouTube video. And sometimes I, I watch and I read those self-help kind of things. And so this one was entitled something like, uh, 10 Steps to a Successful Life. And I have a three by five card and I'm writing them down one by one. I know I can look at the little further down and, and read it, but, but I, I keep track and it, it's, it gets me engaged in the video. And number 10, number 10, if you want to have a successful life, you ready for this one? Stop doing wrong things. Whoa, what a mind blower that was for me. We've been talking about that for like 2,000 years in the church. Stop doing wrong things. Start doing right things. What a concept. But it's not just in terms of your relationship with God, not just in terms of your relationship with each other. It's in terms of your relationship with life. So if you want to be successful, friends and neighbors, stop doing wrong things. I was amazed. But how do you start doing the right things? Because sometimes we get into habits. Habits in our language, habits in our behavior. We get in touch with habits, and they are so hard to break. You ever known anybody who tried to quit smoking? How many times did they try to quit smoking? Five, 10, 15, 20 times. And in your life, has there been some time when you said to yourself after some event, I am never ever going to do that again as long as I live? And then when the pressure, tension, stress, anxiety, things got kind of wild in your life, you did the same exact thing and you swore to yourself, you swore to yourself, I will never ever do that again. And you did it again. You been there? Me too. Me too. So, so changing things is a process and it's a challenge, but it's motivated, hopefully, by love. That there's a choice. Now, when we talk about repentance, this is a phrase that comes up over and over again. Turn or burn. Now, for some people, they like this kind of preaching, verbiage, fire, you know, if you don't turn from your sin, my brothers and sisters, you're going to burn in the fires of hell. They like that stuff. There are some people who really enjoy that. I don't know why, but they do. It seems kind of harsh to me. It seems kind of threatening and intimidating, and I don't respond well to that. I mean, I think it's true. I think that's one side of the coin of repentance, but I think there's another side. I really do. I think there's another side of repentance. Let me tell you about it. Time for something new. When John the Baptist was talking and preaching to the people we read about in the gospel lesson, each of them came and said, what about us? How should we repent? And gently he spoke to the crowd and said, you need to share. If somebody has two shirts, tunics, give it to somebody who doesn't have anything. If you've got food and somebody is without food, you share with them. So here's the two-word answer on that one. Be generous. Gee, doesn't that sound positive? As opposed to, don't be greedy. Don't be selfish. Be generous to other people who are in need. We can do that. The tax collectors, we talked about Zacchaeus last week a little bit, about him being gouging the people, and, and that was true of all the tax collectors. And so the tax collectors came to John the Baptist and said, what about us? How should we Show repentance. Only collect what you're supposed to. Two-word answer, be honest. Soldiers, I like the fact that John the Baptist 
ministered to soldiers. I like that a lot. What did John say to the soldiers? Don't shake people down. Don't extort them. Don't threaten them. Be content with your pay. Be generous. Be honest. Last two-word answer, be content. And and there's this theme, it appears, in that time period of, of greed. But that's not the only sin that people could repent of, is there? In your pew Bible, I'll tell you what page. 190 in the New Testament, in the back part. You can look that up. This is Galatians chapter 5. I don't have it up on the screen, sorry. Page 190, Galatians chapter 5. Verse 19 and 20, or most of 20. And the Apostle Paul, oh, very good. Man. Thank you, my brother. The acts of sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. I'll stop there. There's no shortage of things that people could repent from. You may find yourself in that verse, or verses. And instead of talking about turn or burn, maybe it's time to try something new. If I could go back to that slide. Time to try something new. Hasn't this really been the guiding principle for us for the last year? Try something new. Well, if we can't have the praise team down on here, let's put them up in the balcony classroom. That's a good idea. Let's try something new. If we can't pass the offering plates through the pews like we've done forever and ever that anybody can remember. We've always passed the offering plates. Now let's put them on these flower stands and let's have people just drop their offering there. Let's try something new. Time for something new. Time for something new in how we relate. Time for something new in how we speak. Time for something new. This is the other coin, side of the coin of repentance. Will you try something new? And you know, my hunch is that every one of us has something inside of our own heart, inside of our own soul. It's that one thing that if I could just deal with this, I would be like a really good follower of Jesus. But there's this one thing that trips me up all the time. All the time it trips me up. And I wish it could be different. I'm going to ask the praise team to start coming right now as I continue. We're going to sing a song called Change My Heart, O God. And it's not just a song that we're going to sing to finish the service. It is a prayer that we're going to sing to finish the service. Because in your heart, in your mind, maybe this is the time that it becomes more than just a song. It becomes a prayer of changing your heart, changing your mind that you can be different, that you can try something new with God's help and your life can be better than what it's been before. Maybe that's part of apology, but part of it is also apology to God. When we say, God, I'll never do that again as long as I live, I promise, and then we're back tomorrow or even sometimes later in the same day going, God, I did it again, I did it again. Would you please stand as we sing, Change My Heart, O God. Change my My heart, heart, O God, make Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. You 
no time that is inappropriate to talk to God. You can do it in your home, you can do it while you're driving your car, you can do it in church. God is available to you 24-7. He who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Let us pray. Father, hear the prayers of your people and may they know your peace and your pardon and your power as you continue to work in each and every one of our lives. Hear now this benediction from the book of Deuteronomy. Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields them all day long, and the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. Go in peace, and serve Jesus Christ your Lord. Amen.